Anyway, um, so hi guys, I'm Tobias from Meta down in New Zealand. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about a um, digital signature scheme that we're using um, in attribute-based credential technology um, and verifiable credentials um, to achieve something called selective disclosure. So as Claire said, there's been a bit of homework um, or documentation put out around where the scheme's at today. And um, today I've, I've got a, a range of slides, so um, I can kind of quickly move through them. And if apologies if people have seen some of this content before, um, we can move more on to the advanced topics um, if it's less informative. So many asked like briefly what a zero knowledge proof is. Essentially at a high level, it's a cryptographic technique that essentially allows a prover to prove knowledge of something without conveying anything other than that fact. So it's, it's kind of at, at a high level, it's a, it's a cryptographic technique that um, allows you to prove knowledge of something without directly revealing it. And so um, if, if zero knowledge of the problems, what's the solution? Well, there's lots of applications of them, but where we've been looking at them is doing what we call achieving selective disclosure and data minimization and digital interactions that involve information sharing. And, and that high level means basically selective disclosure with things like verifiable credentials. Um, as we've said before, zero knowledge proofs, it's really important to point out and be honest about the fact that zero knowledge proofs aren't actually the only solution to doing um, selective disclosure and they're not the only cryptographic solution either. And that's also really important. And so um, we like to think that there's kind of three different approaches. And I noticed that this was picked up in the notes that Joanne sent me. So I think there was some interest for people to maybe round back to this point towards the end of the presentation and, and deep dive on these different, some of the different trade-offs that they um, have. But loosely we have uh, what's called a just-in-time issuance model. So if, if you as the holder or the, um, as the uh, end user have a direct connection to the authority on the claims that have been issued about you um, and they're available in lifetime, you can get them to um, create identity assertions that kind of selectively disclose from a, a larger claim set they have on you. Um, OpenID Connect is a really good example of a protocol that is actually selective disclosure in nature, selective, a selective disclosure protocol in nature, although it doesn't uh, create a place for someone to kind of organize uh, claims about them from different authorities into say a digital wallet. Um, you've got a trusted witness. This was discussed in a paper um, that was kind of comparing and, and, and critiquing some uh, aspects um, of zero knowledge proofs, which is the idea that if you employ the usage of a, of a trusted witness or a trusted third party on um, presentation of credentials, they could blind or anonymize the user, but stand by the claims on behalf of you. Um, and so the relying party doesn't get, say, a unique fingerprint for the credential or a, un or a um, unique identifier for the user. And then lastly, there's obviously a, a cryptographic solution, which is obviously where this fits into. Um, just really quickly, um, Kalia, where, how did you want to do uh, questions. Do we want to take them? I can't see the queue, I don't think. So do we want to take so them? So far there up? isn't any questions in the queue, um, but if now feels like a good time to take questions based on what you said, um, that works. We can also uh, watch your hands if anyone wants to raise a hand. Yeah. Yeah. So just let me know. I'm happy to take questions, um, obviously, throughout. So we, so we've been exploring a cryptographic solution and some of the unique aspects that that affords that just in time issuance and trusted witness don't is that you don't need an, another party um, highly available and online at the time that you want to use these claims right so just in time issuance doesn't really work very well for off offline use cases. Um, where you want to present say credentials, um, but you're not on an internet connected device if you can't contact the issuer. Um, just in time issuance doesn't work. Two, trusted witnesses, obviously trust issues with that, employing a, uh, essentially they become a highway or a honeypot for seeing a lot of information. So that witness really has to be trusted. Uh, the irony is in the name there, in, in, in my opinion. And then, so we think that um, a cryptographic solution offers some, some unique aspects to that, obviously. So, however, 
uh, it's also important to recognize that nothing's zero sum. So xenon proofs traditionally do come with some notable drawbacks that we need to uh, account for. Um, whenever you are bringing in new cryptography, you have to contend with that element. Um, any, any kind of new cryptography creates or any new approaches often create new dependencies or um, dependencies on infrastructure. And then lastly, um, something that's been unique to ZKPs and, and is uh, probably pretty general to any new arriving crypto scheme is that they originally do an implementation and they don't focus on speed or performance, uh, more kind of correctness in, in solving the novel concept. So when zero knowledge proofs kind of came first and burst onto the scene, they, they weren't really that performant. And so you had a massive performance trade-off to make when you were deciding whether or not you could use them for your use case. So when we set out on this scheme, um, we set out with some pretty intentional design goals. Uh, we wanted it to be performant. Um, we wanted compactness. So we wanted to bring the representations down to be of comparable uh, representation sizes to traditional digital signature schemes. We didn't want them to be world apart, worlds apart. Um, we wanted them to have a kind of an, a firm relationship to the existing solution. So looking at things like KMS APIs, um, all the big vendors in the world, AWS, Microsoft, the likes all expose key management systems. Um, and there's a lot of vendors beyond that and they have come up with kind of tried and tested patterns and we've evolved kind of our knowledge around key management. And so we wanted to make sure that this signature scheme like fitted in uh, to the paradigms there. So used the concepts that we've become familiar with when we're dealing with signature schemes rather than designing things that are entirely novel, um, really trying to reduce the what's new component of it. And then lastly, leaning on existing standards. So we really want to, to, to design as little as possible. Um, that we could get away with. So wherever there's a suitable standard, we were really keen to take it. Um, so obviously the solution is, is um, obviously based on BBS signatures. And so BBS signatures was first defined in 2004 for those that are interested. Um, it's based on this uh, branch of cryptography called pairing friendly crypto, which was uh, first used in the uh, early, um, late nineties, sorry. Um, and it's used for a variety, peering based crypto as a branch of cryptography is used for a variety of different purposes. Multi-message digital signature schemes, which is what we're using it for, group, group signatures, which is what BBS is, is only one of the use cases. Um, and I can share a link at the end of a really interesting NIST report in 2015. Um, there is a... Um, really interesting, sorry, really interesting NIST report that uh, I can share at the end of this that uh, describes the different use cases that peering-based cryptography offers, along with the recommendation they gave at the time, which was for um, government and the likes and industry to proceed with peering-based crypto, um, and then self-contained signatures and proofs. Um, sorry, so I just, I heard your, I uh, saw, saw your message, Adrian. Um, maybe a little bit further on, we might naturally answer that with some of the examples we've got. Um, and, and we can talk through exactly what those use yeah. case, what maybe what that use so, case is. That makes sense. Okay. So um, what's really important uh, to us is having firm layers, right? So crypto is crypto. And then you have these essentially what I would call um, assertion formats. So uh, many will be familiar with what, what's known as um, the Jose kind of family of specifications and JWS basically describes how you can represent a digital signature in JSON. And that's uh, full standard at IETF and it's broadly used by OpenID Connect and the likes. Um, and then there's obviously this other digital signature representation that has some unique aspects uh, different to Jose um, called linked data proofs, which uh, many will know as the proofing mechanism that JSON-LD based verifiable credentials use. And so our approach to date, so we've drawn boundaries around our technology to make sure that um, the digital signature or the crypto scheme itself can use JWS or linked data proofs. Uh, it's 
there's a clean layer between using the crypto and using what context you're using it in or what what kind of thing you're representing it for um but to date we have uh expressed it in jason ld um for a couple of reasons but for those that are really uh familiar with other zkp techniques that have gone before bbs um, namely the indie um technology today the big things that bbs offer um over say indie is that they can leverage existing schema technology so jason ld is obviously a web uh, a standard at the w3c and because of how BB, our bbs approach um, works it doesn't need a special uh, schema such as the ones that are on the indie ledger um, or even the notion of credential definitions. So credential definitions are kind of derived on the fly. So you're really just, all you have to do is pick the information you want to sign um, and, and sign it. And consequently, that means that it becomes completely compatible with the VC data model. Um, and, and essentially what it adds to JSON LDVCs is it keeps the rich features, but it adds this uh, new concept that enhances privacy. Um, so I wonder if it is, if, if it's valuable just to maybe ground um, this conversation very quickly and then we can jump on to use cases. So, yes. cool. Okay, cool. So, um, well, that's an animation I didn't expect to happen. <laughs> I've been pulling all these slides together and some of the animations have uh, come from elsewhere. Um, so most people will be familiar with this. A traditional digital signature is a message or a payload and a private key. And you use that to produce a signature, right? And that signature protects the message. And then you can do this reciprocal um, operation called verify where you take the message, the public key and the signature, and you can basically detect whether or not the um, message has been tampered with and you can prove the kind of origin of it. However, that forces you to treat the payload you're signing as one blob. So um, in the Jose or the JWT landscape, it means you've got one payload, you've got to put everything in there and it's a fixed payload. And if you touch it in any way, uh, the signature validation breaks. So what we often tend to talk about BBS being is this uh, thing called a multi-message digital signature. And so essentially what it really allows you to do is instead of having one message, uh, you have an array of messages that you would like to sign. And why, why, would, you why would you want to have an array? Like, um, why would you want to break a message up? Well, um, that's because you're actually in this signature scheme afforded this uh, other capability um, called derive and verify proof. So these are unique to uh, multi-message digital signature schemes of which BBS is uh, of one of them. And so you have these two operations uh, that you can perform, which are derive and verify proof. And so what you will note here is that when you are conducting a derived proof, you can choose to uh, hide or reveal messages uh, that you would like to. And um, you use the public key of the issuer, the signature which was used to protect the messages in the first place. So the signature that was produced here and you generate what's called a proof and so note you don't reveal the signature so this is the information that would be sent to a relying party selectively revealing some of the information and the benefits here is you are only revealing the messages you want and you're also not revealing the signature so the signature a fixed signature can act like a fingerprint for the credential so by revealing a proof this proof is uh has has a nonce element to it which means that um, creating the same proof for the same revealed messages sets creates a unique uh, proof every time. And so, and to just relate that loosely, what each message in the context of verifiable credentials is essentially claims that you are, that you are signing individually so that you have this um, selective disclosure. Um, so, now I can go on to the more privacy preserving subject authentication techniques, which because many will note um, that this isn't a complete picture. And if some of you attended the IAW presentation, I'm happy to go through that or um, 
or we can talk about use cases. Maybe I'll carry on and just let me know. I am rocketing through these slides, so let me know if we want to round back. Maybe I'll, I've got a few more slides here and then maybe we can um, round back on, on some other use cases. Okay, cool. So um, those will note that, um, so there's multiple ways to use BBS in this, what we call like a simplified mode, which is just enable selective disclosure, but it doesn't get us all the way there in terms of the privacy goals that we're after. So namely, if you issue a credential like this, your subject authentication mechanism and most verifiable credentials today is using um, what we would refer to as uh, did based subject authentication, as you can see here. And in doing that, you create a unique identifier for the subject across all presentations of the same credential. And so um, what BBS actually allows us to do is what we call a, a different type of subject binding mechanism that um, obfuscates or doesn't, doesn't require a unique identifier for the subject to be revealed. Um, and the way that that works is we have, uh, we essentially bind in to the message. So what you would have noticed before this multi-message digital signature scheme looks like this. With a bound multi-message digital signature scheme, what we're essentially doing is binding in the public key of a key pair of the subject into the signature itself. And so in doing that, what that allows us to do on derived proof is that the possessor of the signature must also have the private key that the signature was bound to and all the messages and they can choose which messages to reveal from and they generate a proof and what this proof actually um, tells the relying party without revealing um, the private key or the public key that the person who generated this proof Generate, had to have a key pair that it was bound to, which is essentially what did auth is, um, and possessed uh, all those natural uh, kind of requirements. So the proof authenticates the issuer of the original statements and what we call the signature subject or the credential subject in the case of verified credentials. So concretely how that kind of looks is that Instead of issuing this, which is a BBS signature, you issue one which is what we call a bound signature. And there's this attribute. This is a hint. So it's not actually a signed message and it never gets revealed. So you'll note here, um, this identifier should be scrubbed as well. You would not um, go to all the trouble of issuing under a scheme and then include a strong identifier in the credential. So this uh, attribute may not be um, warranted in this case, it depends on the credential scheme and the requirements of the credential schema. And essentially, then when you uh, derive a proof, you'll note that this derived proof is only revealing uh, four attributes. Um, and this is a bound signature proof. This proof proves both that the original issuer of these statements, uh, who that was, and also that um, in order to create this proof, the subject had to have the uh, key pair that it was bound to. So there's that um, kind of second factor authentication element going on there that DidAuth provides and makes credentials not bearer, but um, cryptographically bound. However, in doing that, we create another problem, which is how do does a relying party get a stable identifier for a credential that's scoped to itself? So what we call a domain proof. So some relying parties will want to be able to detect that the replay or the repeat presentation of the same credential bound to the same subject, they can, they can uh, detect that. And so what we also do is we include another attribute, which is the subject ID. That's never revealed directly, we just prove knowledge of it. And essentially uh, the signing and verifying process looks the same as before. And the, um, the only difference on the deriving proof is we keep include the domain. So that's an identifier for the domain that we're disclosing the proof to. So it might be a web URL. So I might be revealing my credential to example.com or a did or whoever they are. And, and in doing that, I create this thing called a domain proof, which is a portion of the proof that will remain consistent for them. So the way that it shows up in the credential is that 
the domain might be verified.example.com and this domain proof will remain consistent for this credential for this for this credential for this domain um, and so it is important to note that these more privacy preserving aspect uh, pr privacy preserving subject authentication we are um, actively working on right now and so um, with that that is that's the main kind of guts of the presentation um, apologies if it was a little bit rushed or um, varying levels but um, to answer your question Adrian about the use cases that BBS plus enable um, under the umbrella I, I, I guess it would what I would say is that it reveal it provides a solution to selective disclosure so it uh, takes users away from an all or nothing style um, approach where they're forced into over disclosing information because the credential that was issued to them has more information that surplus to the requirements of where they are presenting that credential um, and unique things that I would pull apart and say that are unique to um, a cryptographic solution such as BBS that isn't the same for just-in-time issuance or trusted witness is that it's more conducive to an offline um, style use usage where you don't need the issuer involved at presentation time and it also doesn't require another party such as a trusted witness so uh, provided the crypto uh, implementations exist it, we think it's a less uh, complicated uh, solution to selective disclosure adrian has his hand up so i assume it's to ask a question yes please so i think we are all uh, very familiar with the open id connect phone home problem uh, yeah. so I, i'm picking on authentication because clearly that's the use case you just mentioned and i think it's a wonderful use case uh, for it to be the sweet spot so uh, I, i'm making that assumption and also we are all familiar with the fact that if i were to single sign on to authenticate with single sign-on uh, using, say, Google or any of the others, OpenID Connect-like things, uh, they generally force me to reveal more information, more, more, uh, more stuff from my uh, in, info endpoint, uh, or whatever the heck it's called, uh, than I would want. Yep. So, uh, and you also raise the issue of correlation, which again is, uh, something to be uh, reckoned with. So uh, would you be able, again, uh, you might have other agendas here, to solve all three of these problems using BBS plus? And if so, uh, the world will be the path to your door. Uh, because this is, I think, all three of these put together, or even two out of three, uh, would probably be uh, really good to solve. Uh, so, did I characterize? Did I make myself clear? In other words, about what the three yeah. problems are. There may be others, but I think those might be the only three problems in the in the sweet spot of authentication. Yep. So. Um... What I would say is uh, absolutely um, BBS can can be a solution to those problems. Um, but I would also kind of say that technology only gets you so far. So like what BBS does is create some um, certain kind of incentives around who is privy to what, which obviously impresses a certain dynamic in a market or in, in an ecosystem, which is good. But um, I'm not going to probably stand here and say that uh, people who implement BBS, uh, like for example, put a finger, fingerprintable identifier in a credential um, and issue it knowing full well that it's gonna be uh, fingerprinted and, and don't give the user a good consent screen, that avenues like that um, still can't arise, right? So the technology can only get us um, so far and we still rely on providers to a certain extent to continue to be more transparent around the consent processes and the releasing of what actually and what actual information is going on under the hood, what information actually is actually exchanging hands. So I'm sorry, I didn't understand your answer. 
if, if I had an authority like Google basically say, uh, issue me uh, uh, five attributes, including my email, my phone number, and yep. uh, whatever. Uh, and then I didn't want, I wanted to use some of those five attributes for authentication without phoning home to Google, mm -hmm. open ID style. Yep, you should uh, absolutely do that. Oh, so that's just basically a yes. So what what were you saying? Uh, why wasn't that just a yes, Adrian? And we could move on to the next question. I, well, I don't um, understand what you said for the in your answer, as opposed to yes, Adrian. <laughs> no, okay. So yeah, maybe maybe I was answering a slightly different question, which is like. Um, technology can only get us so far, right? So the technology can create um, all of the right tools, but you still have to have, uh, say, Google issue under a BBS scheme, right? Those are the, those are the sorts of things that I was sort of pointing out. So we got yeah. two. We have two hands up, but are, are you guys? I don't want to jump in prematurely, but we, are we good for another question? Okay, I don't know who who came first. I think it was neither first. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So. Um, Given that this is the interoperability forum, I just kind of wanted to draw some through lines here to kind of um, explore the fact that not all solutions to the selective disclosure problem are created equal, right? Like as we can see with these models right here, but even different cryptographic solutions compared to each other. Um, so essentially for, we found that selective disclosure for a subset of use cases is kind of a critical feature right, when you wanna preserve the um, privacy of the subject. And so in those cases, you wanna be able to ideally create a credential that's reusable and reprovable. Um, and I think that's really what BBS plus in combination with linked data proofs gives you, um, you know, using pairing friendly curves and then using linked data proofs means that evaluating um, a BBS plus credential is logically um, very similar to evaluating other kinds of JSON-LD verifiable credentials, meaning that you don't get these siloed ecosystems where um, ZKP-enabled uh, verifiable credentials are kind of a special snowflake or they require um, additional infrastructure or logic to process. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's, it, to just kind of draw that through line, that means being able to issue um, credentials that can do selective disclosure, but are also based on open data vocabularies, like the ones found on schema.org, um, which, you know, essentially fits into this sort of distributed data model of the of the VC ecosystem. Um, yeah, so just a starting point kind of for that discussion about how does this actually affect interop and what does this mean for other implementers of, of verifiable credentials? Yeah, so I, just if I could jump in there just before um, I can you um, answer your question, uh, ask your question. What we really wanted to do with this was was make it like essentially if you have to do anything other than really basically call to a call to a KMS to go sign this with this algorithm, then whatever else, what other steps you have to do that's different for you to issue under a different digital signature scheme we found was a risk to interoperability. So what we really wanted to do was the, the only difference that you will see between this permanent residency card that we're issuing um, here in this example under an ED25019 digital signature scheme, which is obviously not selectively disclosable versus a BBS BLS signature is virtually this value here. And the, uh, and, the, and the basically the crypto implementation required to verify it. But there's no notion of a special uh, schema or a special uh, exotic crypto elements or any other steps that you have to require. And, and that was really important to us to promote interoperability because any of those things that exist create a risk to interoperability or create induced dependencies that can be really hard for people to put in to their uh, infrastructure and continue to support. Uh, Parkin? Yes, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. I watched your other two YouTube videos as well. They were very uh, informational. 
Um, I do have two questions. Uh, the first one is, can attributes from different verifiable credentials be combined as with, um, like you, you probably also know that with the Hyperledger Indy, there's a possibility to do so due to the linked secrets. Yeah. That uh, the verifier can know that those two verifiable credentials are coming or has been assigned to the same person that is pre uh, presenting these credentials. Mm -hmm. That would be um, the first question. Yeah. So um, really good question. What we would say is that kind of what's actually actually ha happening under the hood when you are doing it in Indy, um, you are actually generating kind of multiple proofs, but then what you're doing is you're generating a uh, equality proof that the same link secret is used in both credentials. So what I would say is you would see if we wanted to selectively disclose from multiple credentials and wrap that into a VP, you probably look at that as one structure and say that's one proof and it's similar to how an indie single proof kind of works except um, what we have opted for is not to do a link secret approach at this stage and again it's in pursuit of reducing um, complexity so the reason we've done that is so that Essentially, what you'll see here is the equivalent of using a binding to a link secret, a signature to a link secret versus what we're doing is a link secret is a is a more exotic cryptographic material, right? It's less less kind of understood and less reconciled against conventional APIs. You have to treat it differently, um, and in our opinion, it encourages you to use the same secret across multiple credentials, which is um, makes makes that secret actually you're essentially reusing it across schemes which is in some circles actually a, a misuse of cryptographic secrets right you do want them to have quite a um, narrow kind of domain of control and, and usage and it means that the scope of uh, von of uh, compromising that secret is is quite large and so we at this stage don't really see the need for using a uh, link secret. But and it so, would be possible in, uh, in any way, right? I mean, uh, is the signing process totally also possible. blinded? Like, uh, is something being blinded when the um, issuer is issuing the credentials for the um, holder? Yeah, a blinding factor is used to, to um, yes, uh, under the hood and the implementation blinding factors are used within the scheme, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, one final question, if we have time, uh, the subject ID part, I did not understand quite why we need this again, because uh, during the verification process, aren't there any randomization factors like uh, in the CL signatures? Uh, for which example? For uh, this the example? subject ID, I think, um, did it come after this one? Um, there was a problem, uh, meaning that whether a um, verifiable presentation has been used twice or not. And to oh, solve yeah, that issue, that, there just, was a subject yeah, that, ID. Uh, so, that, so the way that you protect against like uh, replay attacks against prevent, uh, prevent replay attacks of presenting a BBS credential when you derive a proof is you use a nonce. So, um, our, our library automatically creates that. You can externally supply it or it will generate one at random. And in the presentation you would have seen online, um, there was a mistake in one of the examples that was given. So I think you might be talking about that. Yeah, so nothing more than a, um, a, a mistake from dragging in an old example, but it's uses a nonce to protect against replay attacks. Okay, cool. And why do I need the subject ID again? Uh, this is the nonce that you're talking about. This is the subject ID in that case, or yeah. So, so it depends again. It, so, BBS offers two different modes. One is you just want selective disclosure, and you want to continue with did based subject authentication, right? So, there's no key pair bound into the signature, yep. and you're just simply saying so you need a did in the credential ID, right? Because when you do the verifiable presentation, you're going to prove ownership of the did, and everything will work much like how credentials work today. Or if you want to bound one because you want to kind of anonymize who you are as a subject, um, then you would bind in a key pair and there would be no credential subject.id in the, in the credential. So those are the variations there. Essentially this, this slide here, this is the difference. So you'll see on the left here, you've in a BBS BLS signature, you've got ID, which is the did. Yeah. And then in what's called a BBS bound signature. You ah. have no 
Okay, I see. That's the difference to be able to hide certain attributes, basically. Then, yeah, it's just not present. It's not needed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks a lot. No worries. So I have a question, but um, do do you have more content you need to get through? Because I don't want to. No, no. That's. I mean, I I have um, some other examples and whatnot, but no, no firm content at all. Okay. So th this. You all might laugh at me with this question. So if you do, that's okay. Just make sure you point and laugh really loudly and then I won't feel bad. Um, but um, so from a concept, just a concept, not the technical definition of perfect forward secrecy, right? So if, if we're sending these things, you know, with where we're combining the frame, but all of the data is still in the token, um, do we have to worry about a case where somebody, you know, so people aren't just reading them and forgetting them. They're now, are they reading them and storing them so that at some point they can retrieve more data from them or break them? Like, is that a, right. is that a concept we have to worry about here? Yeah. So, so this is, that's a really, really good question. So um, yeah. So what, what you're pointing out is that typically, so on a, on a crypto level, what this proof of value actually represents is you're proving knowledge of a signature that had more stuff in it, right? And so I think you ask a really good question to say, right, well, I, I chose to only reveal five attributes. Can, could someone brute force the rest of them um, out of that scheme? And the answer is um, no, it's very, very hard to do. And these, in fact, these schemes are designed, uh, CL signatures and BBS uh, were designed primarily because of other selective disclosure techniques such as um, signing a bunch of hashes, which um, I believe is a scheme that mobile drivers licensing is using and a few others have suggested are actually um, subject to quite, uh, well, easier to execute attacks in order to actually pull uh, the other information that wasn't actually directly revealed out. So um, the answer is no, it's, it's really, really hard. Um, I can get back to you on exactly the kind of properties uh, about that, but um, from from Mike, um, who's a who's an expert on the signature scheme. But in short, no, it's it's very very hard to do. Okay, because you know there's really really hard to do now, and then there's yes. really really hard to do in ten years, yes, you know, or two yes. years. Yeah. So you know, yeah. I don't I, I don't, don't really. I'm willing to accept your word for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I, I don't, I don't want to misspeak in, in, in terms of um, its properties in regards to post quantum. So let me get back to you on 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 that in regards. But um, yeah, in terms of selective disclosure schemes in general, uh, it's it's pretty robust. Um, yeah. Um. Sorry, just to jump in there real quick. Um, was the question about post quantum? I mean, ultimately, I, I was on the chat. <laughs> okay. Um, so my understanding is this is built still built on the discrete log problem, um, rather than like some of the matrix stuff. And so because of that, uh, it's not going to hold um, in a post quantum world. So, I, so basically, the, the hard problems aren't aren't necessarily going to hold. No, so the, the, the nuance I would actually put there, there Kyle, is because um, a single discrete log um, isn't, isn't discrete log, uh, isn't post-quantum resistant, but because um, a BBS signature is actually the concatenation of multiple um, discrete logs because of how the attributes are actually signed, um, the difficulty of reversing out the attributes. Um, I don't want to misspeak, but I, I, I do think that it is actually post-quantum resistant, but um, I will get Mike to confirm. Okay, thank you. Is there is there a designation like post quantum pretty darn hard? Because that might be useful. <laughs> <laughs> or PDG pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah. So so, um, for example, schemes that do use this today, um, APID is a is a very popular scheme that's built off BBS that uses it. Intel use it to protect all the SGX enclaves. Um, they use that so that the enclaves don't get uniquely uh, fingerprinted when they are proving that they are in fact a legitimate um, enclave. And there has been work with um, FIDO on ECDAA, but um, I think that that scheme and 
and uh, its relationship to Web Authent is still um, undecided or not confirmed. Um, are there any other questions? I think going on to the other, the use cases that you have would be great. I have a quick yeah. question. Is there oh, a yeah. reference for how Intel is using this in FGX that you could uh, send us? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can definitely, um, or, or um, Nader or Kyle, if you could um, dig out, there's, it's an open source repo um, and there is academic documentation that accompanies that as well. Um, that essentially they use it so that each enclave um, has a way to prove that it is an enclave um, without uniquely fingerprinting the enclave. And essentially they use BBS plus to do so. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh, so in terms of concrete use cases, um, I mean, this example here is, is one of, is, is a great kind of example use case, I would say, right? So this here is, for those who are familiar with the uh, SPIP cohort work, this here is the current um, uh, permanent residency card and a VC issued under that um, vocabulary. And what it kind of allows us to do is uh, issue a verifiable credential that um, selectively discloses some information. So concretely what this looks like um, from a technology level, I'll just um, stop sharing for a second. And, and notes of uh, interop and, and kind of things to point out in terms of intersection with uh, technologies or, or um, work items at, at DIFF um, of note, such as um, the presentation exchange spec is the syntax we use to accommodate selective disclosure. So um, if I just kind of, I'm not sure which screen I've shared. Can everyone see VS Code? Yeah, great. So, what this um, what this essentially does is allows you to have a signed VC, and so this is a PRC here, which is just issued. Note the only difference here is it's issued under this um, type called BBS BLS, and then you can do what's called a frame. So, what this here is this is a JSON LD frame. So. Those that are familiar with the with the um, standard, it's the W3C standard, which describes how you can essentially, because JSON-LD documents um, kind of live between the space of tree-based data structures, which is what JSON is really about, and graph data structures, which is what the whole RDF universe is about. And JSON-LD kind of lives at the intersection of that. And they enable this thing called framing, which is essentially the ability to take a document that's part of a larger graph and say, I just want this from it. And so what the syntax here is, all the syntax is already um, standard and, and all, all the syntax allows us to do, when you have an empty map like this, you're saying, I want these three attributes, please, from this. So what we do is we take the frame plus the sign VC and we do um, what's called a derivation. Uh, that's really in there at the moment. And, and, and the, what is yielded as you can see, is a uh, BBS BLS signature proof with three attributes revealed. And so the API that we use to do the um, selective disclosure or extracting the attributes from the credential basically just takes the VC and a JSON-LD frame and outputs a derived document. And so that's um, to, to kind of map that to what we were talking about before, what that uh, where that actually uh, sits in reference to is 
it helps to facilitate this API here. So um, it's what we use to organize which messages will be revealed and hidden in the derived proof. So it's, it's the layer above the crypto that allows us to organize at a high level. Um, I want these attributes revealed from my VC and it maps down and performs the required uh, crypto operation to make that happen. So to answer the question about use cases, a, um, a, a use case that um, is, is valid and, and of interest to the DHS and SVIP is the ability to do selective disclosure with uh, a, a document such as a permanent residency card. Um, interactions where you don't need to reveal all of it, uh, you can by using the scan. So I'll just jump in because no one else has their hand up. Um, I was wondering actually about, so I keep thinking of this um, in terms of equivalencies, right? So it's like you can do an indie style anonymous presentation uh, with, you know, between two systems, neither of which are indie. Um, as long as they're both have some neutral semantics in common. Uh, and I keep thinking um, in terms of the, you know, like like uh, the other kind, the, the did in the credential kind can also be done this way um, that you referred to as a two modes. But what really kind of uh, trips me up is the domain. And I'm wondering what, the precedents are there or what kind of use cases that maps to, if there's any sort of do people that have been doing uh, SSI in one or the other tradition until now have to go <laughs> wrap their head around some OIA DC problem space to understand how to best use domains. <laughs> right, that's, okay. So, that's the yeah, thing that, that really trips me up. Right, okay, so that, that's a really good question and so Perhaps the, the, the best context is um, in one of the critiquing papers um, that uh, uh, Dave Longley and uh, I forget who else co-authored that paper was um, kind of describing this uh, attack vector um, when it came to zero, uh, zero knowledge proofs, which is if, um, if you have no way to detect whether or not you've seen a credential before, like an exact credential before, um, then it can be replayed back at you and there can be valid presentations but in certain use cases um, it's useful for you to know whether or not um, you've seen that exact credential before so like essentially double spend so we have use cases in New Zealand where uh, the director of a company shouldn't be able to should be able to kind of prove um, or or sorry, a citizen should be able to sign up to be a director of a company, but they, um, if they are selectively revealing information, there still needs to be enough information such that the uh, relying party can detect whether or not they've seen that citizen before. And they don't want to be able to see that citizen in a global sense, such as they want an identifier for them that remains consistent everywhere they go and everywhere they use their citizen credential. So they, the, what they want is they want a domain specific proof. So an identifier that remains consistent just for them. Um, so it's it's repeat presentation of correlation of credentials for the same domain or relying party. So we use domain here synonymous kind of with relying party, if that makes it any easier to kind of understand what we mean by that. Hmm. So... Uh, you, you mentioned in the video it could be a domain or a did and well, so, I just feel like those are so different <laughs> well so what we mean by domain is like um, information when you kind of disclose information the concept that we're trying to convey is when you try and disclose uh, information um, to someone or to a select group of parties we'd call that the domain of disclosure like who you're mm. releasing that information to, right? So mm. that that party might be one person, they might be logically described with a did, or they might be best described with a website URL, such as mm. how relying parties identify in protocols such as OpenID Connect, or um, something broader than that. And, and so that's what we mean by domain is that the domain or the relying party would say, you know, here's my identifier and you would 
you would decide and you would render that in, in the UI and say, do you want to disclose this information to this domain? And you say yes, and then it will mm. reveal and, and derive a proof and derive a piece that is specific to that domain so that they can detect whether or not they've seen that credential before. Does that sort of make sense? It, it does, and, and actually I hadn't even thought about it until you mentioned it, but that also that implies a certain UX expectation that the uh, end user is, you know, tracking these domains to some degree. Like what if you show the end user a did that isn't resolved and they don't have a pet name for, and they're like, but what, who am I, who am I showing this to? Am I being uh, like uh, that? That yeah. gets into a weird sort of trust assumption of the end user. Yeah, so it's, it's similar to how you render a consent screen in OpenID Connect at the end of the flow when you click the authorize button, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the issuer or the, um, the provider of that service, you know, if, they, if they're going to release information back to this, you know, this website you mm -hmm. clicked log in with, they need, that, essentially, they need to render enough information that's like understandable to the user so that they can kind of go, oh, okay, I'm about to give my first and last name to this domain or, or to this relying party. And so it's, I think, I think some of the UX paradigms are already sort of there, but I agree. It's, it's a big thing to, um, to think through. <laughs> it, can, can we, can we uh, just piggyback that and assume that UX is widespread enough <laughs> that I don't know, five or 10 years of pop-up pop-ups with two logos and an authorized button. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, I I I I'm I, I think um, there's some really good lessons to uh, to pay attention and learn from and and how they've mm -hmm. um, accommodated in protocols like that and how we can do it going forward. Yeah. Um, so that is that that's all the content i had planned in, in terms of um well, the use cases it's great timing because we're at the top of the hour so <laughs> it's all fantastic. working out <laughs> this uh, was fantastic thank you for taking the time no worries thanks for having me yeah it's really fantastic thank you so much for um, sharing with us and also all your team's really hard work to solve these not easy problems to solve in ways that hopefully cross our fingers are developer friendly. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just in terms of uh, check, check out our um, GitHub repo or um, feel free to message any of us on Slack about the initiatives, um, you know, the signature scheme, the um, uh, the reference implementation is all open source. We're all still building on it. Um, our kind of like the issues and what we're triaging and what we're working on at the moment is all kind of tracked to the air. So feel free to um, reach out and, and get involved. Great. Thank you. Um, or <laughs> Juan is asking me what's next week. I don't know yet. What's next week? Uh, this is embarrassing. Uh, we're not really sure. We never had confirmation. Um, I guess uh, we'll email out as soon as we know what we're doing next week. And there will be a separate email when I know what I'm going to be when I grow up. Um, who knows? Who knows what order they'll come in? Um, great. So thank you so much, Tobias, for coming. Sorry I had to miss the beginning. Uh, but it sounds like you still got some great questions for the for the YouTube channel. Um, hope you don't mind. We're going to put this whole thing on YouTube and uh, increase your celebrity um, rating on websites. Um, yeah. And stay tuned, everyone. Uh, see you next week at our other time slot. Thank you. Good, Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good night, afternoon, thanks, everybody. morning. <laughs> Bye. Have a good middle of the night somewhere.